So who are these students we'll be talking with today? It's um it's for the Cheney community, George, but it's but we're streaming it to everybody. Okay. Uh, so we're streaming it on Cheney's um platforms and um Cheney's YouTube page, Cheney's Facebook, all of that. And so the community, everybody. And you you feel free to share it on your page if you want to. Yeah, I'm gonna share it right now. Okay. We need to do the same. And Dr. Hall, great work with what you're doing with the uh, Instagram page. I can follow us on Instagram. Oh, thank you, Miss Monique Adams. Let me see. Uh... <phone rings> I'm sharing it to our pages. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. And we wanna welcome you to the second installment of Cheney University Summer Scholar Series. Um, this series is, is so important and pivotal to not just the Cheney community, but this one y'all is for the culture, okay? Hashtag for the culture. Uh, the Sim Summer Scholar Series in a nutshell is a series of discussions that aim to look at the practices, problems, and healings that need to take place um, with Black folks throughout the diaspora. And so we want to start the discussion. And even though some of these discussions may be uncomfortable, uh, they are discussions that need to be had. They, they are discussions that are necessary, and they redress the pathology that has been created by racism and racist practices in America. And so we want to make sure that you understand that those may be starting at Cheney, it is not relegated to Cheney. Though these discussions may be about Black folks, they are not relegated to Black folks. Racism and the manifestations of racism are issues that affect Black, White, and everybody. So we want to make sure that everybody is having these conversations and everybody is involved in these conversations. So we want to hear from you. So make sure you like, share, and tag this um, also, we want you to comment. We want to be able to answer any questions that you might have. And so we're going to go ahead and get this party started. Today's topic, for those of you who may be new, uh, who may be new to this, today's topic is uh, the Black Superwoman, right? We're talking about the Black Superwoman, how this particular myth, narrative, and stereotype is hurtful and helpful to Black women, right? hurtful and helpful to black women. And after that, today's discussion, hopefully you'll be able to make that decision. And so now I wanna turn it over to our panelists. I wanna give them about uh, one to two minutes each to introduce themselves um, and work on a start. I guess we'll go in alphabet alphabetical order. We're gonna start with Mrs. Adams first, Mrs. Money Adams. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, once again, I'm Ranika Money Adams. I serve as the Executive Director of Student Affairs here at Chain University. I've been working in higher education for 18 years now, and, but I've been a Black woman my whole life. And so this is certainly a topic near and dear to my heart. And I certainly have some personal testimonials around this, the subject matter and its impact on me as an individual. I'm excited for our time together. All right. Um... Next, Dr. Sessoms. 
Good morning or afternoon now it is. Uh, name is Dr. Amber Sessoms. I am by training a school psychologist and I'm also um, a principal consultant for my, for my firm, Natural Inclination, where I really support courageous leaders in being their full authentic selves. So I grew up in Middletown, Pennsylvania, uh, the younger generation might be now familiar with that because if you saw the Three Mile Island documentary, I usually say that before and I, I say TMI and I think I'm saying too much information, but I'm from a predominantly white town and everyone that looked like me was either my sibling or my cousins. Um, so I, I grew up really having this really devalued sense of who I was as a, as a black girl and later a black woman. So this work is really personal to me and thinking of disrupting those narratives that are in our head about who we say we are and where we fit in. Um, so I'm really excited just to be in this dialogue with these fantastic Black women today. Thank you. All right. Last but definitely not least, Dr. Georgine Bess Montgomery. Peace and blessings, everyone. She says, my name is Dr. Georgine Bess Montgomery. I am interim chair of the Department of English and Modern Languages and also recently promoted to full professor, yay, for that. Um, uh, I grew up in a small rural town in South Georgia called Glenwood, um, moderately mixed, black and white. Uh, we went to the same school from kindergarten all the way up to senior, uh, but, but grew up with racism all of my life. I went to a predominantly white institution taught at that institution, experienced it. But a pivotal moment in my life was um, when I discovered Michelle Wallace, the myth of the superwoman and the, what is it? Oh my God, I can't believe I'm not, I don't have it. The myth of the superwoman and the black, myth of the black macho and the super, and the black superwoman, I think is the name. And she really brought to the forefront. It was a very controversial text. I think it was her master's thesis. Uh, it really brought to the forefront this whole idea about uh, this black woman as superwoman. And I certainly grew up with a mother whom I thought was a superwoman. All of us did. Um, and that was a and that was a feat that we celebrated without ever really thinking about the consequences of that. You can't be a superwoman without there being. Uh, adverse effects. So I'm excited to be participating in this discussion about what it means to be this perceived superwoman, particularly when we internalize it and are thus unable to ask for help, unable to say uncle. Come on. Y'all see what mm -hmm. I Y'all see it already? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And so um, before we get started, because, you know, this one is for the community, for the culture, and I want to make sure that everybody has, because Georgine really did a good job of leading us into that. I want to make sure that everybody has um, an understanding, some idea of um, the Black superwoman, what, what, that, what that really connotes, right? Um, and so follow us, because sometimes we're going to use the black superwoman and a strong black woman is interchangeable terms because they're essentially meaning the same thing. And so before we go any further, I wanna offer you guys a sort of a working definition. Um, so in the New York Times article, um, there, is a, there was a clinical psychologist who offered what I think to be a good definition of uh, the black superwoman or AKA the strong black woman. She says it is a cultural icon born of Black women's resiliency in the face of systemic oppression that has dismantled families and made economic stability a challenge. The Black superwoman is self-sufficient and self-sacrificing. She is a provider, caretaker, and homemaker. She often suffers in silence, which goes back to what uh, Dr. Bess was highlighting, right? And so I want to ask um, my panelists, do you guys think that is a, a adequate definition of the Black superwoman or the strong Black woman? Is that an adequate definition in your opinion? In my opinion, it's, it's definitely adequate, especially when we talk around that about the suffering and silence, right? So that, that need to do all and be all to all people in our lives. And regardless of whether or not you are a biological parent, adoptive parent, or you're mothering a community, 
there is sacrifice that's built in. And when we talk about what that's grounded in, it is grounded in families being separated during enslavement and the black woman having to pick up after losing children, after losing family and still press on. So that, that resilience that we say is there, I almost look at resilience sometimes as being a dirty word when it comes to black women, because it's almost, the world has perceived it as, oh, that's just what they do. But on the back end of that, that just what they do results in hypertension, results in diabetes, results in several other health pathologies that are tearing us apart and aging us internally without changing us physically. So we will say that black don't crack, but we do crack internally, even yeah. though our faces may look 10 years younger than what our chronological age is. I have a good friend who's a, a therapist, Salah Alaf, and she uh, often talks about de defined depression as anger turned inward. And I really think that's accurate. And I think it's not just anger, but it's stress. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the lemma. All of those things turn inward, which means we are not expressing it. So I think that the pre that definition is so on point because I think I like that term, a myth of the superwoman, because uh, we bought into it and buying into it has caused us to be silent about the cost of being that superwoman. I'm over here like preach, amen, all of that, right? Uh, this is buying into the myth, right? We're buying into the lie. So what you're both touching upon is this idea, this, this American exceptionalism, this trauma response that we have to endure. And we start believing that the trauma response is our personality is who we are, but it's a result of the systemic inequities, the trauma, the, the, you know, the violence that we've always endured since we've been, you know, brought over here, you know, against our will. So I think that is such an important piece of what you're both touching upon that, that trauma response and thinking about the anger, the N word and all those things that we have to work through and, and disrupt in our heads to keep going and, and suffering in silence. And I know you talked earlier about thinking about looking at your mother and how your mother endured and you looked at, wow, my mother is so strong, this Kate, but it's because of a trauma response. It's like, there was no other way to go about it. And now in this moment in my 41st year, I'm saying, enough. Mm -hmm. My mom is still saying, well, you work from home and you can do X, Y, and Z and you can clean your house. You can do all this. And I'm like, why do I have to endure that? Cause I'm wearing the burden of being a mother, being a wife and also being a black woman. So all those intersections and how it continues to, you know, damage me, like where I'm continuing to, to, to have a stress response. And then my mother from generations before I was, I was single. I raised four kids on my own and all those things still not healthy, but like, disrupting that for myself and saying that there's a better way to live. Yeah. There's a freedom, there's a liberation in that. And that I don't want to pass it on to the next generation for my, for my three black children, my three black girls. And um, I, I love, cause it's, it's so, it's so synergistic. You know, that's my new word of the day. It's very, very synergistic in that it's like a word, which is so you guys, it's like you read my script. Okay. So, <laughs> Sessoms, when Dr. Sessoms talked about, um, breaking the chains of, um, of her mother and, 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 and her grandmother and all these other people. I think that I, I, I go back to um, something that I remember a long time ago, I was dating this guy and he used to tell me about how his mother cooked and cleaned and did all this kind of stuff, right? And, um, and at the time, you know, I was finishing my doctorate and um, also teaching full time and and working up or down on the weekends because, you know, yeah. So uh, I was doing all these different things. And, you know, so cooking went on my agenda. Like, that just, right? So one of the things that I shared with him and I, and I told him, I said, you know, you, you brag about your mama doing all these things or whatever, right? I said, but the problem with a, a lot of you brothers is that you hold antiquated notions but want to live in a modern world. So you say, my mama did all of these things. Number one, I can guarantee you, your mama didn't like doing all them things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Number two, I can also tell you that if she did all those things, that probably your daddy was paying all the bills. Come on now. Church, tabernacle, okay? Right. 
So what happens is, is that we have to be very, very honest and clear about the fact that, you know, if we're going to, we, we really have to um, untrain a lot of our brothers uh, in, in this, in this, in this uh, a fallacy of believing, believing that their mothers did all this work, their grandmothers did all this work and they were happy and they were happy about it. Because when we go back and we talk about the definition of this, this strong black woman and this superwoman, remember that the thing that we, we, we most often know is that these women were suffering in silence. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Suffering in silence. So here your mother is after she's worked a long day, right? And we, we also have to realize that, you know, um, for the same thing that many of these brothers are celebrating us for, we're also penalized for it. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, people that are watching may say, well, Dr. Hall, what what do you mean? Right. So when we look at our uh, when we look at our white counterparts, right, this is idea uh, when you talk about uh, when you look at um, history. Right. This is idea called the cult of womanhood or the cult of domestic. The true cult of womanhood. Right. So, you know, you cult of true womanhood, the cult of true womanhood. Right. Right. And the cult, or some people call it the cult of domesticity, right? Mm-hmm. So in this, in this idea, there is uh, this idea that white women are fragile, to, they are fragile, they're delicate, they're to be put on pedestals, and the men are to do all the work. So on one hand, our heart goes out to our white sisters because this, uh, the, this definition for them was very imprisoning, right? It was very imprisoning, but in many ways, it was a chosen prison, Right. And so uh, uh, feminism was a movement to kind of uh, counteract and stop those ideas. That's why feminism took place, right? And so this is where a lot of, this is where uh, that, that uh, a tiny bit of antagonism comes in between we talk about feminists and black feminists because black women had never had the opportunity to be fragile or docile. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we never really had that opportunity because of racism there were things that we had to do. Like it, it, we couldn't say, I'm just going to stay at home. No, 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 no. You got the word. Mm-hmm. Or oh, as Nanny was saying the, in their eyes, watching God to sit, be able to sit up on high. Cause she says the colored woman was a mule of the world. Girl, yes. There we go. Yes. There we go. There we go. Get to sit up on high and have other people do the work for us. Mm-hmm. Economically, it was not possible. Socially, it was not possible. So those were things that precluded us from this idea of, of this, this doc, uh, docile nature and femininity. But if we look at that in a very modern context, right, we still have, uh, uh, and people may not even realize how unconscious and subconscious these viewpoints have become in their mind frame. We constantly hear uh, many men, particularly uh, African-American men, who talk about the hardness of black women. When the opportunity to be soft for many of us, is just not there. Right. It's not there if we're realistic about it. And so I wanna hand it over to my panelists and ask them what, 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 what say you about that? What came up for me when you were talking this, this dichotomy, right? So how we have to pit ourselves against white women. So they exist and we exist because it's this, this battle of like, here it is, they can be docile, they have to be protected. Like they are comforted and protected at all costs. It is almost the antithesis for us, right? Like we are in the opposite. So that is how we have been defined and that's how we survive and that's how they survive. So this whole idea, like when you talked about feminism, I'm so glad that you brought up the difference between white feminism and black feminism because it wasn't a movement for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this idea that we have to be hard because understanding again, going back to system and going back to this pragmatic approach of where you're asking those questions is, the world wasn't designed for us, right? Like this nation is not designed for us. It is designed to support white supremacists, like patriarchy, that, that notion. So they are able to survive because of the docile nature of them, the, the, you know, the media perpetuation of them and the, I can't think of the movie now. I'm blanking on the movie where the, the birth of a nation. So thinking about that, how that solidified for America that white women are to be docile and feared and protected and the black male beast, you know, the monster is after them. Like we came out of this notion of like, that is how they existed. So this idea and this myth and this lie has to be broken because 
we are not, we are still whole complete people, but we've had to operate under this system that says, this is how you have to be to survive. And, and white women are just as trapped in the system as we are. So mm -hmm. when you're saying like, I'm looking to my white, you know, sisters to say like, wake up. Like, that's where I'm at. Like, wake up. Like we're all these sleeping giants and wake up. Because what I say, if I'm being completely honest, is I believe that white women to a large extent uphold white supremacist notions, right? Because they can look at and say, but I'm a woman. And they can use that as a crutch at their intersection to say, but I understand because I'm oppressed, but they uphold the notion in the way that they, they maneuver and the way they talk about and the way that they still will put themselves right up high yeah. And so go believe they don't see us as sisters. Um, right. So that is a, a super problem when you're looking at it from from that lens and saying like they are upholding that system um, because they believe that it's supporting them and it's not as hindering them as much as it's hindering us. I won't say as much as but it's still hindering them. Yeah. And, and that system is not even viewed as affirmative action on their part. Right. And so because we exist with this dual with intersection when it comes to our womanhood and our blackness for white women to benefit from affirmative action, it's never considered that. And we know that if we go to the data, the greatest beneficiaries of affirmative action were not folks that look like us, it was white women. And so quite often they've benefited from the very struggles that we've led, we've gotten behind. And we know that even with Ida B. Wells and Sojourner Truth and things of that nature. So I often wear a t-shirt that says, ain't I though? Because occasionally I need to remind myself that I am still a woman. And there are certain spaces where I show up and I've worked in a predominantly white environment where there's an expectation that when things happen, I am the strength in the room, right? I am somehow the um, equalizer in that space. Everyone else has room, freedom and flexibility to be anxious, to cry. I mean, think about it. For those of us who have operated in white spaces, if we break out in tears, if we speak passionately, and I'm putting that in quotes on purpose, it is considered to be anger and all of a sudden you are somehow inept for you to actually operate in the same feminist space that white women operate in. And so our men will even occasionally look at us and not expect for us to cry. Your mom, your mom cried. When she was sitting there and she was doing all of that work, she went into her room and when she went into her prayer space, who do you think she cried to? It may not have been in front of you because unfortunately we don't even have permission to do that, to cry in certain spaces and to emote as we should as black women. And we're doing a disservice to our children when we don't do that. So I make sure that my children see me cry. Occasionally I'm still battling that. You know, if a tear drops, I'm, I'm doing this, but my 14 year old will look over and say, okay, so what's going on? You're crying. And I'm glad that she's being raised to tap into what's going on with people because that's not how many of us were raised. My mother just did. I know she cried. And so did my grandmother and great grandmother, but we didn't see those in certain spaces if it wasn't a funeral or if it wasn't church. I remember when my father died at 12, my mommy was left with, in her early forties with, um, I think nine children, which I didn't think anything of because I was 12. But when I reached my forties, I reflected on, oh my God, this is where my mommy was when my father died. And the reason I never reflected on what her struggle must have been is because she never uh, depicted it as a struggle. I never saw her struggle. She kept that on the inside which is what we as black women often do. We don't show that vulnerability to our children. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to, so when I reached that age, I was like, oh my God, mommy, what you must have been going through to have lost, you know, your husband and to be left with these children who were, some were in college and some were uh, like, my youngest brother was nine. Mm -hmm. What did that look like? What did that feel like? Who do you go to? Who do you talk to? Who do you cry to? But it was not anything that we ever saw. And I think we learned, we internalized that subconsciously or unconsciously. And we are taught that is the way we handle our, how we process things to not, you know, what's that commercial, never let them see you sweat. 
Is that the uh, secret commercial or it's a deodorant commercial? Never let them see you sweat. And that becomes a slogan for too many of us. We don't allow anyone to see us sweat, to see us cry, to see our vulnerability. Mm-hmm. And it's just, uh, and, and, and we turn all of that on the inside. Can I just say, I mean, I thank you both just for naming that um, and going back and, and, and reclaiming that part of your history and that re- reclaiming that and, and changing it. That self-recovery, when I think of like bell hooks and thinking about going back and looking at our ancestors and how they did things and saying like, that wasn't, that's not right. I'm going to change that for myself. So the fact that you're saying like to be a whole person, right, that I should be able to express the fullness of my emotions and that my 14 year old daughter gets to experience that so that she learns that we are full, complete people, that I have a righteous rage or whatever that I'm experiencing, that I can sit with that, I can name it, I can recognize it, I can let it pass through me as not part of our experience like this. And there's there's that American piece of that tied into that, like emotions are separate than who we are, but we are full, whole people. Mm -hmm. So bringing all that together and you sitting here and naming it and going back and saying, what was it, what was it like for my mother at this age to do that is that healing work. So just thank you both for just naming that as we continue to navigate and think that we have to keep the way the things used to always be because it worked. It right. quote unquote worked. And we're like, no, it didn't work. Right. And that we're changing that. Thank you. And and I want to, I want to revisit something that you got. I want to revisit something um, that all of you have been kind of touching on, right? When um, Dr. Sessoms uh, talked about um, the convergence between feminism and black feminism, right? One of the things that, you know, they even talk about this in critical race theory, um, that one of the things that we know is that there's this thing called interest, com- interest convergence, right? And in interest, what interest convergence says is that um, the white community only allies itself with the black community when it is beneficial to them, right? And that is one of the reasons why we have seen most black women stay separate from the feminist movement and create their own movements such as feminism and, and womanism, right? I, I, I prefer to call, be called a womanist. I'm not a feminist thing, right? Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, that is where we see this, this, this the problem come in is this idea of interest conversion. And we're seeing it happen right now, even when we talk about, um, we talked about the issue of Trump and we talked about abortion, that now all of a sudden, you're saying black women, why won't you do this? Why aren't you saying this? The whole time we were fighting, but because it wasn't in your interest, you didn't see it in your interest at that time, you thought that our struggle uh, meant nothing, right? Mm -hmm. We've got to, and so I think that we've got to really, really, there has to be this sort of undoing about what racism is, you know? There has to be an undoing of this, this, this fallacy of racism means that you're a bad person and you you done right, you done black people wrong. There has to be undoing and undoing of what the understanding of white privilege is, right? Like I heard this comedian, he and he just thought he really said something. He was like, How could I be? Uh, he was like, right privilege. I grew up in the trailer park with a t-shirt. But brother, guess what? When you left that trailer park, if you bought a suit, nobody ever knew you was poor. Right. Mm-hmm. That's white privilege. Uh-huh. And for me. I got three degrees, three degrees, and consider myself to be pretty smart, right? But folks still going to see me as both black and woman, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you say, well, why, Dr. Hall, why did you separate those two? Because, you know, Bell Hooks talk about the double conundrum of race and sex, right? To be both black and woman, it is a a conundrum. It's a confusing situation. Why? Because there's already a set of a stereotypes and, and prejudices against womanhood, right? Against femininity. But then there's a set of prejudices and, 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 ra- and racism against my blackness. But then when you put those two together, right? On the bottom of that totem pole uh, b- below, everybody is black woman. Mm-hmm. The world has an understanding, just like say for instance, even with our brown sisters and know many of them are black, right? But with our brown sisters, a lot of our brown sisters, what happens is, is that their anger is a lot of times described as passion. They're so passionate, right? But the minute I get passionate, I'm the angry black woman. Yeah. I remember one day, because I'm very theatrical, 
Um, I was acting out an episode of Real Housewives of Atlanta for our, our secretary uh, at the school because she was asking me what happened. So I was acting it out. And one of my counterparts came in, one of my white counterparts came, came in and she said, Carolyn, what are you so angry about? I'm like, sir, what? You know, it, it threw me for a loop because why would you assume I was angry, you know? And so it's just like, even in those moments, right? That we don't even understand how even the racism is working in those mo moments because racism has bred or indoctrinated folks in such a way that they believe that stereotypes are true. Yeah. I remember when I went up for tenure at Georgia Southern, I had a white chair who denied, the committee supported it, but the chair denied it. I immediately went to an attorney and was asked, is this racial or sexual discrimination? And as I reflected, well, a black man had been tenured and promoted. White woman had been tenured and promoted. So I could not select either category mm -hmm. because what happened to me was because I was a black woman and there was no category that allowed me to check black and woman. I was going to have to choose. I was going to have to have myself, my identity. And I would have, and I was set up to lose mm -hmm. because I had no, there were no statistics. There was no data that was going to support me being discriminated against because of my race or because of my sex. And that's the foundation that Kimberly and Crenshaw has worked with intersectionality right there that you're naming. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Something else you said that when you were talking about, uh, Dr. Hall, like the, this blueprint, this idea, I watched the, the master class with Cornell West on, on, uh, um, what was it? I don't remember the title. It was like black love. Um, but, Black, it was the Black History Month one, but he talks about that like white supremacy versus black love and always going back to naming that, that, you know, even in our fight, like saying womanism or like that, this is not for us, white feminism is not for us, that we have been the blueprint. And then when it works to the advantage, like they're coming, it's, it's like they're taking notes, right? Because our liberation is not just for us. It never has been, uh, but they're coming and taking the blueprint and saying, oh, well, why don't you work alongside us? So going back to that mule and all that mentality, like we are trying to liberate everyone. We are a collectivist people. And this idea of like out for self isn't working. And that's why we're like, that's not for us. But I think, and also, I think you had, did you have um, Dr. Eddie Glaude there a few weeks ago? I think yeah. so that value gap piece is coming up. So when you're talking about like white supremacy and privilege and all those things, it's like that we still believe. And these are things that we have to unlearn too, as black women, as Black people, brown people, that white bodies matter more than our own bodies. And we see evidence of that all the time in the media, that our bodies are not important, that our, that our lives are not important. But this idea of that value gap that comes up, that we have to continue to disrupt as, as well. Was, I, I heard that when I was coming, I was like, that was coming up in my spirit, that idea that we are the blueprint. And that also like this value gap that who, who says who is the value more and that my existence is the result of being dehumanized so that you can rise above. Right, right. And we have to remember, we're, we're the same folks who took uh, elements of multiple types of music and created jazz. We took leftovers and created gumbo. And we don't give ourselves credit for the very things that we've done. And I understand that there's a function of our educational system that contributes to that. But when we talk about those stereotypes that you mentioned, we've internalized them. How often have we watched the news? And when certain things have happened with our young people, we've contributed to the very stereotypes that we're hearing the newscaster say, especially when it comes to our young women. Well, no, she shouldn't have been dressed that way. No, she shouldn't have done this. No, she shouldn't have done that. Well, my body is my temple. And no matter what I wear on my person, you have no right to violate it. So we, we've got to remember to pour back into ourselves and not contribute to those stereotypes. As you were also speaking about our men, I'm, I'm thinking, I hear Malcolm X whispering in my ear about Black women being the most disrespected people in this country. And I believe that to be true. And unfortunately, because we've internalized myths and stereotypes about ourselves, there's some within group disrespect that continues to happen between both our men and our women. And so we're forgetting to come back to that love that Dr. Cornell West was speaking to. And by the way, that program is still up on Amazon 
video. So if you've got Prime Video, I, I encourage everyone to take a look at that. Yes, I took, I don't know how many pages of notes. It was like, I was back in school. <laughs> I love it, I love it. I do the same thing, Dr. Sessoms, because uh, Cornel West is my other mentor in my head. Okay, I'm gonna meet him one day. <laughs> I wanna throw, I wanna throw, uh, I wanna throw a caveat out there. One of the things that, um, when I became, when I became aware, like for me, whenever that light bulb goes off, I try to make sure that I unlearn what I believed before, right? And one of the things that I had to uh, unlearn was respectability politics. And you guys have touched on that a little bit. Yep. Um, I remember about two, 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 two years or more ago, um, I got into a big, because you know, Facebook, everybody, everybody know everything. Okay. So I got into a kerfuffle, if you will, um, with uh, some of my sorors and some other people because uh, they were talking about um, they're sick of, you know, these black women going out with these bonnets on their head and these um, house shoes and because they're making black folks look bad and this sort of thing. And I said that, you know, and my issue is this now, I, I'm, I don't go out of the house with a bonnet or house shoes and that sort of thing. But if I did, that's my that's my choice, right? Because it could be an emergency. You never know what people what people are going through at that moment, right? But what happens is is that when we make these sort of momentary judgments, what we engage in is the idea of respectability respectability politics, right? And uh, I believe in the scripture of Erica Badu when she says, "What good do your words do if they don't understand you?" And so, because we're talking to the community, I want to explain what respectability politics are. Respectability politics are, 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 this, are this view that Black people or, 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 or uh, disenfranchised groups get treat, treated a certain way because they've done certain things to earn it, right? They've, they've done certain things to earn the mistreatment. So in this, a lot of times, um, like say, for instance, you hear, you hear a lot of people say, well, other folks will respect us if Black folk will respect themselves. Foolishness. Let me say that foolishness. Why is it foolishness? Because when you look back at every major movement uh, within our community, we, we have always respected ourselves, carried ourselves with dignity, and people were still disrespectful. They still took every opportunity to dehumanize. So no matter how I'm dressed, it really doesn't have anything to do with it, right? And so, and I think that the other thing about those respectability politics is that it causes a chasm to be drawn between the haves and the have-nots, right? It's kind of like back to that old comedy skip, skip that Chris Rock did when he said that there's a difference between Black folks and N-words, right? If we are foolish enough to believe that, then we buy into the respectability politics and we, call, we cause further disenfranchisement within our community, right? Um, and so what happens is that if we continue to see it as a us and them, right? Like Black women, if we see... Uh, educated Black women differently than we see sisters who have not had a traditional education, then we're part of the problem and not the solution. And so I think that even in this, in this, um, this, this, this idea of the strong Black woman or uh, the superwoman, we've got to really sort of undo this, 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 because it, it, it is a pathology. We got to undo this pathology that says that that we have to represent in this particular way. If I'm sad, I'm gonna be sad. Well, I'm on crying, right? And so I think that we have to allow one another to be human. And I think that that is going to be also part of that solution. Go ahead, Dr. Spears. Dr. Hall, yeah, I hear what you're saying. And, and I agree for the most part. All of this has degrees. All of this is on the spectrum, you know, with too much, uh, not enough, or just j maybe just right. But uh, 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 I, I dealt with a student of mine the other day. She was very upset, she was gloomy and upset and just, just angry, fuming about something. I said, uh, hold up, you know, we can look at it a little differently. She says, don't I have a right to my emotions? Indeed, you have a right to your emotions, but you would be better off if you learn to control them and direct them so that you were the master of them. And the same thing with this discussion, and it goes to the heart of the topic that we're teaching this year, uh, uh, assimilation. Uh, you know, uh, we're not trying to get totally assimilated, you know, and we talk about the Asians because they're over assimilated, but we all have to assimilate to some degree. I mean, see, uh, Madam C.J. Walker uh, became rich and famous because she got the product that helped us get our hair together. And we all use it to some degree, more or less by choice. 
And when I go out there and I was had to get on the public service the other day when my car was in the shop, I got uh, the chance to ride public service and I saw a brother get on with his, his slippers and socks and 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 bathrobe onto the public <laughs> onto public service. And you know, we've seen some of these situations where people are just to totally inappropriate at the bank or they're not gonna get what they want looking the way they look. And this is our job as a university to polish our kids so they don't come out of some bag, you know, sim simple things like in class, you know, uh, uh, Renika, what do you think about this situation? Now, if you said, I don't know, and act like you didn't know, you didn't care and weren't about, you know, that's inappropriate. We have to bring them along so they understand how to interact in society uh, so they can meet their goals. And so to look on this behavior with kindness and it's knowing we're all, this is all our community and we mm -hmm. got rifts in the community between light skinned and dark skinned and this hair and that hair and everything and the poverty situation. Do you have two parents? Do you have one parent or what or whatever? We got a lot of reasons to separate and segregate. And that's what we have to avoid doing to see each other as all part of one community. Look on that fella up in the bank with his bathrobe on and say, all right, that's, that's my brother. You know, that's my brother and I God bless him and I wish him well. And and, and and just to know that that's not a choice I'm going to make or or encourage anybody that I, I know to make and and maybe to look at things differently. So I hear what you're saying. But even when we talk about this whole race thing, all white folks aren't aren't voting for Trump. Thank God they didn't, you know, and, 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 and all women aren't, you know, any particular way. None of us are monoliths. So getting our getting those that do have an open mind that actually want to learn and some that are right at the front line with us, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the understanding what the politics are and, and how to uh, 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 express them, I think is so important that we recognize the nuances and, and welcome our allies in where we do find them and, and, and direct our kids, what, you know, this is not, this is not going to get you what you want. And I'm not saying sell out, but you know, there's different ways to approach this. So that's my piece on that. Okay. I guess the, the questions that come up for me and, and all of that, right? I was raised by my, my grandmother and like, you got to work 10 times as hard just to be seen. Um, all of those things, right? Professional. Like when I tell you I shaved my head uh, at the beginning of COVID and she about wanted to spank me because one, I, I'm a doctor. That does not, that's not professional. They're going to think you're a man. They're not going to take you seriously, right? It's not professional, so I am very intentional about showing up in the way that I show up because I'm trying to be, I want to be my full self in all my spaces, like the wearing the mask, the taking it on and off. So it makes me go back to the foundation of it. So if we are teaching people to be a certain way, who gets to define what that certain way is? Who has always defined what that certain way is? Like when I talk about intersectionality, I'm talking about the norms. I'm like, who is norm? I'm over norm. Like norm gets on my last nerve. And I, I'm kind of like projecting because I had a former <laughs> supervisor that was named norm. <laughs> But I'm done with norm. So all these ideas, like, so the questioning that we have to constantly ask ourselves to make sure that we're thinking critically about things is that, are we putting on that assimilations perspective? And is that harmful to me showing up? Because when I do this work and I even talking with white women, talking with whomever, it's like, when I show up to this meeting, I might have eight meetings in a different day and I'm showing up eight different ways. And that's exhausting. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't have to do that? White men do not have to do that. So therefore they are the norm. They created all of that. And that's not right. So this idea of like that, I have to be like, we got to teach our people how to be better. I am done wearing that, that extra weight of being like, I got to show up and do this perfectly because it, it represents my entire race and my entire journey. That is exhausting to me. So, and I get at the same time, when I say that people will say, well, then you're not going to get what you want, or it's not safe for me to be my full self in this space then it's not an idea of like us as individuals. It's a, there's an issue with the structures in place. Like, so how do we keep going back and naming that and not putting it on like, well, my brother's showing up with a bathrobe or, or that they're popping off at the mouth. All of those things, I think we have to like take, take a pause and create some space that we can use our righteous rage or, or use how we show up in a more profound way to really look at the root cause. Right, and I'm, I wanna interject here, even when you talk about showing up as your full self, right? Because I, I made the move from uh, Georgia to um, Pennsylvania and God bless you. last year, right? <laughs> and one of the things that I'm very intentional about is not losing my Southern accent or feeling that I have to speak in a certain way, right? Because one of the things about sometimes, not all Northern people, but a lot of Northern people believe that Southern accent connotes ignorance. Uh, no, boo. Okay. I'm from the South. I'm going to sound Southern. 
Absolutely. Okay. Ooh, I'm not from song. California. I'm not from New York. I'm not going to say, hey, yo, son. <laughs> how we speak, right? Um, because every particular place that you're from is going to have its own dialect. It's going to have its own tonation. All of those things, are uh, th those are just a part of who we are, right? But I'm very intentional about being me. Now, that does not mean me is not going to be articulate, right? Because me can be in a room with anybody and be comfortable. But me is also going to be me. And I don't feel that I have to change me to make other people feel comfortable. So when we talk about the idea of respectability politics, what I'm saying is, I'm not saying that because I uh, anybody that knows me, I take every opportunity possible to pour into young people to tell them about being their best selves, right? But I do not think that if they don't ascribe to their best self, it in any way uh, is inherent of their blackness, or says anything about their blackness. No, if you see, if we saw, and I also think that us having these discussions does not mean that we're not embracing of white allies. In fact, we're having these discussions because the truth needs to be known, right? So if you're saying, because like, say for instance, one of the things that black women within corporate America and within higher, uh, higher, um, higher learning uh, here quite often is that black women are very standoffish, right? Well, what, what am I supposed to do? Because every way of my being to you is wrong. Well, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I'm open, next thing you know, I'm too open. Right. If I, if I, if I do exert my uh, disagreement, I'm too, I'm too, I'm too vocal, right? I give you an example. I have been in, because uh, people always ask me, well, why, why did you never try to work at a PWI? First off, my heart is with uh, students of color, primarily African-American students. That's my heart because I was that student that needed that nurturing. But even when I have gone for jobs at PWIs, right, called back for two and three interviews, and the problem that they'll have is, well, I think her language is too elevated for our students. That's a code for something else. Mm -hmm. Why would I, as a college professor, have too elevated of a language for a group of students that you're trying to elevate? Come on. That part. You know, that part. Okay. So what happens is even in that, what you're telling me is that my way of being is too, uh, too aggressive, too confrontational. I'm too vocal. But that's me. And so we, so, so that, so, so the problem comes in and this is, you know, uh, but the problem comes in is that we don't let black women just be. Let me alone. If I want to go in my house shoes, let me alone. I'm like a crush. You're speaking to this ease, right? When I hear you talk about, I came up here and I was, I was like, God bless you coming to Pennsylvania. <laughs> I'm in, I'm in Hershey, Pennsylvania. So like all the prayers, please send them my way. Um, oh, but think about that idea, like being at ease, like you're being yourself is giving license for someone else to be like, again, like that psychological safety. I can be myself. I can belong. That's what we all want. Like when you think about Maslow's hierarchy, like that is fundamental to who we are as human beings. And we are denied that from the moment we, we take our first breath in this world. So we live this whole, that's why you talk about this, this psychological safety, this wearing the superwoman cape, because we're trying to survive in a world that says like you are, are not lovable, like you do not belong. So this idea of like conditional belonging that I had to learn how to play the game, right? To get ahead. Like I want unconditional, I belong because I, it's my birthright, it's my dignity. I don't have to earn that. And that's what I, I hear you saying. I'm like, that is so important for our kids to hear that. I especially in academic spaces, right? When I, I remember my doc program and I went to Penn State. So, you know, my goodness. Them saying to me, when my chair was saying, you're brilliant. And I remember I'm the only black person in the class. And I said, are you just saying that because I'm black? Because that was my experience. Like I was always the smart black girl. It was always a caveat. But mm -hmm. I always have to ask, because it's like that I am the exception to the rule. Like what is the rule? Going back to what is the rule and disrupting that and, and thinking about how I have to unlearn it. But that always comes up to me, like always having to overcompensate always doing the most instead of just being at ease, like just being able to breathe is such a gift that we do not have the right to, to do. And I'm like, enough. Like, how do we get to that space? How do we cultivate those spaces? How do we create spaces like this where we can confirm and contest that and work to make sure that we are cultivating that for the other ones that are coming after us? Because that is a gift that we are not given. 
That is so true. And can I tell you that both of you talking with your hands is so refreshing that, that I thank you for talking with your hands. And, and the reason why I say that is because in, in my 18 years, 17 years of working in higher education and being in spaces where we are not the dominant, I have had my hands held in places because even my body language is policed. And so what does it look like when you show up in a space and you are told that even your body language is unfriendly and unwelcoming? Well, I talk with my hands and I would always be excited when I'd come in contact with uh, Italian colleagues who are all about hugs and talking with their hands. And I'm thinking to myself, well, wait a minute. I don't have the flexibility of being in that, in that space, but you know what, sis, since you want to give a hug, let's hug, let's talk with our hands, let's have this robust discussion, because even some of our allies are also oppressed in a certain way when it comes to their behavior. So to have this woman show up and say, oh, no, we need, please be your, I, I want you to show up as yourself. I, I want you to be your authentic self. I talk with my hands because she noticed my hands were resting on my lap. That's not my original position. I'm in a family full of folks who talk with their hands and emote with their bodies. And so to even see it on the Zoom screen, but I'm sitting here still, right? Policing myself, even in this safe space, says something about what we internalize. So thank you for emoting with your body because that's what we do as a people. And even that is something that we hold in and we are functionally depressed. One of you said, I think it was uh, Georgie mentioned how depression is anger, anger turned inward. I, I believe this superwoman notion for black women, we are functionally depressed. Yes. So many of us are walking around here depressed, but because it hasn't been diagnosed, because we've got trust issues with the mental health profession, my bachelor's degree is in psychology. I wanted to do that because I wanted to get beyond whatever our trust issues are. But there is something to be said about how we are walking around with all of these isms and, and issues that we're leaving unaddressed because of systematic problems that we've experienced over the years. I remember uh, when I attempted suicide and how shocked everybody around me was. I was successful. I was uh, doing what I loved. I was a uh, university professor. I was working on my PhD. I had a beautiful daughter. I was the one people came to for advice. I was the cool hip happening chick who had it all together. And I was imprisoned by this idea of being a superwoman who has it all together. And I could not say to anyone, I need help. I didn't have the language to articulate that, to express that. I remember after attempting suicide, uh, one therapist told me we were able to function. I was like, I was dysfunctional. I tried to kill myself. So she, even as a black woman, she was unable to see this, that I was struggling. Under, she was unable to see my feet underwater just struggling, peddling, trying to stay afloat. And finally, I was I diagnosed as suffering from depression, but from a but also I think from a lifetime of holding all of my hurts inside and not knowing how to express anger, not knowing how to express disappointment, not knowing how to express sadness. All of that was on the inside. And I imagine me multiply by most by all the black women whom I have encountered. So people say, when I tell their story, you are so brave. And I think it does take a lot to render yourself vulnerable, but I also share with my students to say, it is okay to ask for help, to say uncle, rather that, than to, as they say, wake up dead. And everybody wondering why, everybody being shocked because you had this facade for so long, don't know how 
to break, you don't know how to break out. So I think that what we're talking about today is so important because we really have to move beyond this idea of us being a superwoman. Yes, I can be, I can do it all, those are slogans, but we have to ask at what cost? It cannot be at the cost of my self-preservation. And too often, it is at our at it is at that cost. We pay too high a cost. I remember one of my students, she was a freshman. She says, My mom is a strong black woman and she was proud of it. She worked three jobs to take care of my brother and me. And I had to say, that's wonderful, but at what cost to her? Is she able to eat? properly is she is she able to get enough rest we have to stop celebrating this ability to do it all right Mm -hmm. because we have bought into this idea that is who i am supposed to be so during the truth ask i am a woman on time Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. i i have to fight for you know for for my femininity for my feminine self Right. And we so she did. We do. And we have to uh, fight to access that access, that 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 aspect of ourselves and to be able to share it with the world. Georgia, I feel like we're family now, so I'm just going to call you Georgia, because I think that's what I heard people (laughs) say. But just honoring you just for your vulnerability and transparency, because. I did a lot of crisis response. And I remember just naming that for people. Do you want to kill yourself? And the weight that you could feel it in the room would come off of of them, right? Because you're taking the stigma away. You're normalizing Mm -hmm. things that need to be talked about um, because this is what we do. Like we we have this trope that we have to, we have to aspire to like being the strong black woman. And that, that it's cracking, it's cracking. And you were dealing with this. Like, how do I manage if I'm not this, then who am I? but our identities are not tied to that. So when you're breaking that and you're naming that, I just want to honor you for even speaking that in this space. And I pray that anyone that's listening to this, right, that they understand that there is hope, that we have people that we can reach out to, to get support. I know even for me, right, in Central PA, there are not people that look like me that do this work. I'm now, I'm like, I was so excited. because the first time in my life I found a Black therapist now in Philadelphia, but it's tarot therapy. But I say that I had the first meeting with her last week. And I said, sis, I'm just letting you know <laughs> that I have all the faith in the world that you're going you gonna to get me all the way together. Cause I said, because these people out here can't get with me. <laughs> I need someone to get with me. But that idea of like that trust and the faith and understanding that experience is always really key. So for you as a Black woman to name that in a tradition that doesn't name it, that doesn't talk about suicide, that doesn't talk about depression, is also leading to that liberation to say that we are full yeah. human beings yeah. and that we need support and asking for help is not weak. What you did is the strength mm-hmm. um, to, to name it and say that I need help. So just thank you for being able to acknowledge that. Yes. Um, I want to, you know, cause we're getting, we're getting um, to close. I want to ask our, you know, I want to ask our um, guests if anybody has anything that they want to share or contribute to the discussion. Can I just plug a book? Um, I don't know if anyone's read Dr. Tama Bryant's uh, new book, Homecoming, but she um, she talks about racial trauma. She comes from a womanist like psych- psychology perspective. She will be the incoming APA um, president next year. Oh. Which is the first, I think it's, I don't know if it's the first black, but definitely the first black woman. So in 2023, it's ridiculous that we're having these conversations and saying the first, the first, the first. But her book, when you're talking about it, she brings a lot about like coming home to ourselves, mm-hmm. right? Like when we're out of alignment and coming back to your, to our bodies and sitting in that, um, it comes up a lot for me. And like, you're also, when you're talking about the trauma response, it makes me think of Resma Manicum's book, that My Grandmother's Hands, mm-hmm. where he talks about trauma. Now that's, a, I will preface it and say that that's a heavy read, right? Because there's, there's exercises in there that can really help you. But the one exercise is really sitting and inviting one of your ancestors to come back. And you can't pick the ancestors. So I'm like, there's some heavy stuff, but you have to put that down for a minute. But those things coming up and how we metabolize or don't metabolize trauma in our bodies and how we push it through to other people and other things really comes up in what you're naming. So those are two books that came to mind um, as you were in this discussion. 
Right. So one of the and, things is okay. that, and I don't know if our guests um, are going to chime in because we, we touched on it and, and I know we're about to, we'll be coming to a close soon, but Georgie mentioned this and so did Dr. Sessoms. Um, when it comes to getting support for ourselves, mental health is self-care. I don't get my nails done every two weeks, but I do go and have a conversation with Sandra, who's a dope Jamaican sister that I have a great relationship with. So when we, if I can go and get my hair done, I can go and take care of myself. I can pour into myself. If you can show up in a church every Sunday, you can show up on someone's couch and unpack what's going on because you don't have to have, have, to have this separation between your faith and your mental health. If you are a, a Christian believer, we are to seek wise counsel and that wise counsel is not limited to your pastoral staff. Absolutely. It's not limited there. So make sure you take care of yourself in that way. There are free resources in Philadelphia. There's a, a consortium of black psychologists. If you live in Philadelphia, they are offering free services this summer. Take advantage of those things because once you get started, it will be just like you going to go get your nails done. I have to have this done every two weeks. I have to connect with this individual because they are helping me to help myself. And we don't help ourselves as strong black women. I can help everybody else and I save myself for last. I mean, we talk about Jesus. I don't need a man because Jesus is my man. We talk about taking our burdens to the Lord and leaving them there, uh, but that's not helping us with our problems. That's not addressing our spiritual, physical, emotional uh, needs at all. And I think we really have to move beyond that cliche, I'm taking my burdens to the Lord. And also therapy is not an easy thing always mm -hmm. to open up and render yourself vulnerable and one of the things that I have experienced is that with my therapist, I don't have to edit myself the way I do when I'm talking to people whose opinion of myself I value. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, if we're talking to our pastor, if we're talking to our friends, we are editing what we're saying. We are not being as honest because I am still wanting to control how you perceive me, what your opinion about me is. And, and, and when you're talking to somebody you don't know, that's already hard. So when you really start talking to somebody you do, you do know, it is hard to be that honest. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that we have to recognize that. You know what? I'm going to throw this out, too, because I've been talking a lot about that in different lives that I've been doing, um, you know, with uh, church girls. Right. Because I'm a church girl. Love the church. Right. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm in my car speaking in tongues, all right? But, um, but one of the things that I think is important, though, is that because I've been talking to, um, because I, I think that we, you can love something, but also be honest about something too, right? And one of the things that I've been saying that the church needs to do, because I still think the church is a very much necessary institution. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Right? But one of the things that we've got to do is we've got to start addressing mental health. Yeah. Okay? Um, there's this apostle, like he's a Puerto Rican apostle. His name is Alexander uh, Pagiani, and I might be mispronouncing his last name. And uh, he, he said something that I've been saying forever. I was telling that a lot of things that we call generational curses in our community are actually generational trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything ain't the devil. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff is mindset, right? For example, if you see this sister who she has, she keeps just having baby after baby after baby after baby, right? And you notice that that was the same pattern that her mother had and her grandmother had, and none of them have ever been married and they all have been struggling. That's not a curse. That's a pattern that has been caused usually by trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was never dealt with, right? Um, and, and I think that we have to learn a different way of addressing these things. And so what he said that that really it was a it blessed me so because sometimes people have to hear from people in their circle because a lot of time the church thinks that uh, the academic world is is, is in uh, a battle with them right. Mm -hmm. Remember when I was working on my doctorate, I would have relatives uh, that would say stuff like, "Don't get so educated, you don't believe in God." Now where they come from? Right. Where they go heaven? You know. 
So, uh, but, but, but people really do have those sort of belief systems a lot of times, believe it or not, right? They think that the, the higher education is going to be the undoing of your belief system. And, and I, I can maybe see how, how some of them have felt that way in some spaces, right? But what he said that was so pivotal, and I'm glad that he said it, is, is that everything is not a spirit. Something, some things that we're seeing are mental health issues, mm -hmm. right? But a lot of people, believe it or not, are more willing to embrace the idea of demonic possession and oppression than they are that they have a mental health issue. And I even try to change the language in my family when they say stuff like, oh, so-and-so got a mental problem. No, 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 no. A mental health issue, just like you have uh, uh, acid reflux. Uh -huh. That's just a, you know, a minor infraction. You didn't you, you, maybe you ate some bad stuff, you didn't have no business eating, and you got a little acid reflux, right? Got a little bloated. Well, in the very same way, mental health issues can happen to anybody. It's not a problem, it's a health concern. Mm -hmm. We all, at some point, are going to have a mental health concern. Let me tell you something, I don't think nobody can pray as hard as I pray. In fact, my students used to come to me and say, Dr. Hall, would you pray for me? Or you got some of your oil with you, right? But guess what else I'm going to do? At the same time, I got to a place where I realized that there's some things that are going to cause for that wise counsel that the Bible talks about. And, 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 and that though my pastor or bishop or apostle or whatever I refer to a spiritual discernment, that they are lacking many times in the, in the area of psychological mm -hmm and mental training that would be necessary to address some of those concerns that we have. But I wanna move forward and I wanna talk about how, cause we got about 10 more minutes about how many millennials, uh, their answer to their, 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 uh, their response to stopping this idea of, this, of the black superwoman or the strong black woman is they got two movements going, right? Black girl luxury and a soft life. And I was telling, I was telling um, my our panelists at the beginning that I'm, I'm liking these movements, but what concerns me about them is that I think that they sort, they're, they're sort of leaning in the direction of elitism and materialism. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I remember uh, there was this this one Black Girl Luxury page that I belonged to, and I would I posted some kind of quiz that was supposed to be funny that said, oh, if you get a 10 on this quiz, you're a bougie, you're a bougie girl or something like that, right? And so one of the questions was, if you love Cheesecake Factory, you bougie. So some sisters were responding and saying stuff like, who eats at the Cheesecake Factory? Like, that's low budget. And what I'm afraid of is that many of them are starting to believe that things and the acquisition of stuff is the undoing of, of, of having to be the strong black woman, right? That self-care is about stuff and not an, and not an inward response. And that's right. what I'm really getting at. And mm -hmm. I'm, guys, what do you think about these movements? I think you're on the me, that's, that's you're bringing okay. up the, that's bringing up the commodification of our world. It's bringing up American culture, right? Mm -hmm. The more things I have, the happier I can be instead of looking at the internal work, the, the self. Uh, so it's just aligning yourself again, like not, not recognizing for what it is and saying like, this is the American dream. This is what makes me happy. This is how I know I've made it. Or even for me, like, you know, at one point in my life, I was a single mother and I knew very clearly that if I looked a certain way, then maybe they wouldn't have these ideas about me because I'm showing up in my black body as a single mother. Well, that's just, you know, like your mama and, you know, your, your grandmother before you. But this idea that if I show up a certain way, then maybe they'll respect me. Maybe then I'll belong. It's this idea of belongingness that is, through buying things instead of really focusing on the interior, like that comes up for me often, right? So I have to even constantly challenge myself in that, right? Like, as my family is like, well, you made it, you live it in the house with basically like the picket fence, all those things. What does it mean to make it? Mm -hmm. So I keep going back to the question, like, what does it mean to have arrived? Arrived where? Where are we supposed to be? <laughs> like, what, where, where am I at? Right? Those things come up for me and, and thinking about that. And, and to piggyback off of that, I often wonder, what does it cost us, right? And so these goals to have made it and for you to get certain purses, what does it cost us? The reason why our ancestors were able to show up in some of these spaces as being strong was because there was community. 
So once I got educated and, and did all of these things and I arrived in my suburban home, I'm going to tell you that my, my neighborhood doesn't look like and doesn't operate the way that the neighborhood that I grew up in on 2nd and Franklin Street in Wilmington operates, where somebody's mama was my babysitter so that my mom could go work three jobs and my aunties helped me with homework and things of that nature. So the question becomes is what will you lose as a consequence of making it? Because the value of your purse does not determine the, the content of your character nor the value of it. So I can have a great price bag and a messy personality. It doesn't speak to who I am as an individual. So I don't want our, our young women to trade off the value of a bag for their self-worth. And that's what comes with the risk of it. And, and I, I'm saying that as somebody who enjoys shopping and has way too many shoes, but rehab is for quitters. So yeah. that said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not being hypocritical. I'm, I'm owning what I come with in this conversation, but I'm also mindful of what it costs me in the process. So a great bag and great shoes are wonderful as long as your character and you've got the things that you need to go with it. I remember just being a supporter of retail therapy, having to be out shopping. But as I have uh, healed more, I realize I don't have a need for those things mm -hmm. anymore. I, um, so I think that we, as you said, we oftentimes uh, translate self-care into doing uh, material things for our bodies. When it's not do when we're just as empty on the inside, just as conflicted on the inside, just as sad on the inside, and then we feel the need to go out and do it again mm -hmm. to try to assuage that emptiness that's on the inside. So we really have to be cognizant. I think of these trending moments that are oftentimes superficial. They sound good. They got a nice ring to it, but we have not thought about it. We have not engaged in any kind of deep reflection in terms of what does this mean? Mm -hmm. And I think engage, like, so when I, it makes me think about Instagram, right? Because I just, when you were talking before and I'm like, oh, one of my mentees has one of them bags. I can't remember the name of the bag, but you know, she just started out. I'm like, how she afford? When I looked at the price of it, I said, how she afford that bag? But here she is. But you, you scroll through Instagram, that is all you see. So then you mm -hmm. believe that those lies, like those fake, those narratives that they, that's really true. So it makes you feel like you're lacking something. So I always encourage people to, to purge their Instagram accounts. I know I just did that recently. And then I started looking at the people that I follow. What are they saying? Are they speaking truth? Are they speaking life? Is it light that they're giving off? Or is it just the idea that I have to compare myself? And I got rid of all of those. So feeling like I put some of those in the chat, but just like back liturgies, like all of those different things about ways to be contemplative and really sit in this idea of lamenting, but not in the way that makes us feel bad about ourselves, but leads to freedom and liberation. Those are the things that I choose to fill, fill my spaces with my social media accounts. But if I look at my 19 year old social media account, I'm like, sis, you got to get rid of some of that stuff because that comparison comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I always believe I would tell people that comparison is the thief of joy. Mm hmm. You know, because you'll get to yes. compare yourself to people like, I, I, I just don't believe in it. I, I'm going to be the best me and I'm going to be popping. OK, Man. when we start when we start looking at other people and what they're doing and what they have. That's the problem. That, that, that's the problem. That, and I think that too many of our younger sisters are doing it. And so that's why they feel like they constantly have to be acquiring this stuff because they're comparing themselves. Like we see it on every campus possible. Right. But it's time to wrap it up. Ladies, we're, we're going to have to do a part two of, of, of this discussion because y'all, I, I want to pass a collection plate, okay? <laughs> I want to say before we go, this whole idea about the superwoman, I think it can also lead to this other, uh, another problem is the imposter syndrome. Yes. Because we yes. are mm, presenting yes. this world mm -hmm. that we are all of that. We are this strong woman and mm -hmm. we know inside that we aren't, mm -hmm. which then will lead us to question our, our real value, our true value, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. then leads to this imposter syndrome. So that's something else we have to also think about a lot to know that we 
truly belong. And I think once we begin to be honest with a big, become our truest self, being honest with that self, I think, and in our abilities, I think that will also help with that imposter syndrome. You just gave a benediction. Yeah. That's okay. That's so before we go, though, I got to have, I, I want each of you ladies to give us your social media, media handles. Uh, and your books, I want Dr. Best. Tell us where we can find your book and the name of your book, Dr. Best. Spirit and the Word, A Theory of Spirituality for Africana Literary Criticism. Uh, Georgie Best Montgomery, Africa World Press. Also, it's available on Amazon. And I am in honor of my Shango and Oshun self, Sweet Lightning 330 is my Instagram. Sweet Lightning 330 Instagram. All right, Dr. Sessoms, tell us where we can find you. And if you have any books we need to purchase. Listen, you about the 50th person I said, when you're going to start writing, um, I'm going to work on that. I, I take that as a You might nudge. get that word, Dr. Sessoms. Yes, word, I know, please. right? Uh, my <laughs> Instagram, I was, tr- I was so busy trying to, hey, Georgia, could you put yours in the chat? I am. Thank you. Uh, but mine is natural underscore inclination. That's my Instagram. It's usually how most people find me. I'm really, I'm not really great with, with Twitter, but usually I'll just post things on there and that's usually how you can find me. But I do have a website, um, aninclination.com. So if you uh, want to learn more about me, that's where you can find me. And I'll put that in the chat as well. Okay. Mrs. Adams, tell us about where we can find you. And if you have any books or anything, uh, books or services, you know what's interesting, much like Dr. Sessons, there's a book that has yet to be written, but I do have a title. Um, okay. I'll get to it. That said, I, I, of course, can be found at Cheney University. I'm the only staff member with the last name Money, so I'm easy to find if you visit our website. I often joke with people that it does make me easy to find. On Instagram, my handle is Ain't I Though. So when I talked about Sojourner Truth, I often tend to lean into uh, her experience, and that's one of my favorite poems. So, ain't Ms. I know is how you can find me, Mrs. Adams. Please don't ever become a preacher because you know they're gonna that, <laughs> the money. <laughs> okay, um, so we thank you, Dr. Spears. You had some closing um, comments that you wanted to make for anybody. No, just really glad uh, that I managed to get into this session and looking forward to the future ones. This is just so uh, heartening and consciousness raising and just thought provoking. I really appreciate it. Thank you, ladies, all so much for, for being here. Okay, Miss Tracy, go ahead, Miss Tracy. Yes, I wanted to say thank you too. This is just this is just such a joy just to do this on our lunch break. And I think we definitely should have a part two and a part three. And, um, you know, it's been, it's been very, it's been great. It has been. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And thank you again. And I'm just so glad too that, uh, look at, look at how God works. The sister, our sister HBCU, uh, Clark Atlanta University, which is my alma mater where I received my doctorate. Uh, I'm so glad that Dr. Best did not see this as is something she couldn't do, but we just join forces and hopefully we will be able to do more things together and with Dr. Sessoms too. Dr. Sessoms, you're my kind of people, okay? Listen, and I said, don't hold it against me because I want the Millers and I'm a trustee there, but I was like, <laughs> but I love, I love y'all. I love y'all. Okay, well, I thank everybody for today. I thank you guys for coming. I thank everybody on YouTube and uh, be on the lookout for um, the Summer Scholar Series. Please like, share, tag, follow, and comment, because we want to hear from you. Because again, this is for the culture. All right, we're signing out. All right, how about y'all?